will speak on Bavink's Doctrine of Common Grace. Thank you, Reverend Lanning. Thank you, Reverend Spronk. As I take on this task of speaking on the subject of Bobbing's view of common grace, I think about the fact that uh, the two subjects we've had on so far, the subject of the covenant and the subject of the, of the church, well, the speakers would be able to speak on areas of agreement, areas in which he, uh, Herman Bovink, made statements with which we'd very much be in agreement, and bring out the positive aspect of what he taught, and also to bring out the, the errors that we must stay free from. With the subject, of course, of common grace, to be speaking specifically on the on the air that we disagree with, uh, the theme itself is that the air is negative. However, it's, uh, we can view this from a positive point of view uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, whenever we deal with anything that is not true, the truth is the opposite of the air. And that the places where a person goes wrong, when we think of, well, what is the truth over against where that person went wrong, that that is helpful to us, that that's a way that God uses even the heirs for our profit. But also that um, this teaching of common grace understanding the different elements of common grace, and I plan to speak on some of them, is helpful in that common grace thinking is very easy to come into our own thought. And that if churches decline, they're going to start thinking more the way a com someone who holds to common grace things. And so when we understand the principles over against the air, and the more we understand the significance of those principles, the more we are on guard against the same thing coming to us. Well, that brings up the whole question of what is common grace? That's one of the things I become more familiar with, I think, uh, especially since I've moved to Northwest Iowa. I become more familiar with people who are in churches that hold to common grace but aren't familiar with the term. And I may have to work with a, somebody that's dating someone, say, from outside of our churches and they're not even familiar with common grace. They've never heard the term mentioned before. And then it's important to bring out, well, what are, what are the, the aspects of common grace? And the fact that there are different aspects to it, and there are some that hold to common grace type 1, some that hold to type 2, some that hold to type 3, and some that hold to all different kinds, that there's different doctrines that are common grace positions, and some hold to them all, and some will only hold to some, and they will reject the others. But when we bring out the different aspects of common grace, and it's important that we are able to do that, then we help others to be able to see the seriousness of this teaching. And that it is the case that it is very easy for us to go in this direction ourselves. 
From the start, it's important to recognize that common grace and particular grace was maintained uh, by Bavink and Kuiper at the same time, that they were claiming that you could actually hold to both, that there's a kind of grace that's particular and a kind of grace that's common. Some people have thought with regard to Dr. Abraham Kuyper, for example, some people have thought, when did he shift from teaching particular grace to teaching common grace? And they're familiar with the fact that we have published his book on particular grace. But when he started teaching common grace, he was, as he started, when he was starting to write as his work, he speaks on the fact that he's not saying that he denies particular grace, but that there are two different kinds of grace, one that is common, one that is particular. And that, that's why Reverend Hooksima was, when in the controversy of 24, people were acknowledging that he was fundamentally reformed, but they were upset with him that he was only speaking about the particular grace, and he would not speak about the common grace because, of course, he could not, because he recognized that it was, it was contradictory. And when you get to be teaching contradictions, your writing becomes less clear. That's one of the difficulties of studying this specific subject and being able to find out what specifically was the man teaching on common grace, because you can read a section in which you have a few paragraphs where you're fully in agreement with what he is saying, and then you can go down the line and find further paragraphs down the line that wonder, now how is he saying this now? He said back up here, he said this. How does he square these two in his mind? And of course, he's not here to ask him. And though you, have to, you can start reading broader in his writings to try to find, if you can find some passages where he tried to put them together, that makes studying an error um, more, more difficult. But with regard to well, that as kind of an introduction, getting into the subject specifically of common grace, his view of common grace, I want to bring out three different teachings of common grace and bring out what he said about them. First is the idea that when God gives good things to someone, that itself is a gift of grace. That's one form still today which is so very common and that's a, an area of thinking that we can fall into too is the idea that if, if you receive something good from God, and if you did not deserve it, then it's grace. And if you receive more of it, you receive more grace, more blessings. It's very easy for us also to fall into that, to, to that thinking. That kind of thinking comes up with the, in, in Bavink's writings, with the thinking that if you receive life, longer life, if your life is preserved, then you receive grace. And an example of that is found in his teachings concerning Cain, that uh, Bavink, that when Cain was driven out from the presence of God, yet he has grace. He says, Cain is driven from God's presence because of the fratricide, because he killed his brother. Yet he continues to live. Grace is thus given to him in place of strict justice. And that's from his, uh, uh, his speech on common grace, his rectorial address that's published in the Theological Journal of Calvin's Theological Journal, volume 24. I'll be making some references to that in addition to his Reform Dogmatics, page 40. But notice it says Cain is driven from the presence of God, so he doesn't have communion with God. And yet, he continues to live. 
So that means he's, he's receiving grace because he's continuing to live. He's getting something good. He's continuing to, to have the bodily life that he had. And uh, instead of strict justice, as he said, instead of dying on the spot, therefore he is receiving grace. That's related also to the idea of the covenant of Noah. The idea that God makes a covenant with the human race. And that's the, the specific reference to the covenant of Noah, that there you have a covenant with the human race, no flood, no destruction. Well, that's going to be a blessing then of grace to the whole human race, because there's no destruction that's going to come, and, then, and man really would deserve that destruction, but God does not give that upon him. Give that to him. That's something good that the whole human race receives, that that is uh, a gift of God and thus grace. Notice, though, with Cain, that that means you can be apart from God. You don't have fellowship with God, yet you have grace. Grace without God. But that's just getting lost at the visible. It's something good that someone gets. Looking at the external, it's something good they get. They don't deserve it. And it's losing the idea that grace is favor. It's not simply whether or not you receive something good, but whether you receive it in God's favor. Looking at Cain, Cain is driven from the presence of God as one cursed. And yet... He could look at that. Here is a man who is put out of the presence of God as one who is cursed. And yet he could say he's receiving grace. Stuck with that thinking that if he received something good and didn't deserve it, then it's a gift of grace. Now that carries over in areas too, that idea. Like... God makes known things through creation and history. God makes known himself through creation and history. He makes himself known through the scriptures. So man receives uh, what God makes known to him. That, according to Bob Inc., is grace. Revelation, he says, is grace says, this is from his Reform Dogmatics, Revelation, therefore, is always an act of grace. In it, God condescends to meet his creature, a creature made in his image. Continuing on, uh, that was a quote from the Reform Dogmatics. This is from his speech on common grace. Revelation continues... But it changes in character. Oh, I should have led into that. Now he's talking about what happened after the fall. He's saying before the fall, Adam was in a covenant of works, which was already mentioned, that Adam was in a covenant of works with God. But after the fall, now when God makes something known to him, it's going to be grace after the fall. He says... Revelation continues, but it changes in character and receives a different content. Now revelation comes to guilty man who merits death as a revelation of grace. He deserves death. God speaks to him. Therefore, it's a revelation of grace. Life, work, food, clothing come to him no longer on the basis of an agreement or right granted in the covenant of works, but through grace alone. That now, when he receives these things, that is grace. Now that would refer to when God speaks uh, in creation and history, as well as in scripture. In creation and history, says, uh, this is from, this is actually from our reasonable faith, but however, essentially the two, speaking of the revelation and creation in history and revelation in scripture, 
as is commonly been referred to as general and special revelation. He speaks about those two and says, but however essentially those two are to be distinguished, they are also intimately connected with each other. Grace is the content of both revelations, common in the first, special in the second. So he was claiming there was a common and there was a special, but in such a way that the one is indispensable for the other. So what God makes known in creation and history is said to be grace. God made something known to him, and that is a gift of grace. Now, the same applies then when God speaks in Scripture. That also is said to be grace from his Reformed Dogmatics, uh, volume 4. It says, frequently... Even for those who harden themselves in their unbelief, it, referring to the preaching of the gospel, is a source of various blessings. The enlightenment of the mind, a taste of the heavenly gift, and so on. These have sometimes even come to those who later fell away and held the Son of God in contempt, with reference to Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. So although he says elsewhere that God does not desire the salvation of everyone, right in the context he says that, that God does not desire everyone to be saved, yet he says that there is a grace in that preaching, there, is a, there are blessings such as the enlightenment of the mind. God speaks to the person. The person hears things. He hears the truth. He doesn't deserve it. It's grace. All of those ideas lose the idea that it is not given in God's favor and that it does not benefit them. Those two ideas. That although God gives something that's good, whether you're talking about rain and sunshine, or whether you're talking about God making known truth to a person, although it's something good, they do not deserve it, it's not given in And it does not profit them. And that's another area is that, and that's going to lead into number two here, is that he's going to speak about how it actually benefits. That's how one leads to two. But it, is, it doesn't. When God gives good things to an unbeliever, it does not profit them. Rather, they are left more without excuse that although in the Reformed tradition and Belgic Confession, Article 2, and in the teachings of John Calvin, there was a making known that, yes, sure, God makes known things even to the unbelievers. But it is the case that that is that they might be left without excuse. Or in our canons, when there's a reference to the remnants of natural light or the light of nature, there's the reference that man has these things, but he can't, it doesn't profit them. He can't use it aright even in things natural and civil. He doesn't benefit by it. He holds the truth in unrighteousness and is left more without excuse. That he has a certain knowledge of the truth and of natural things, but that leaves him more inexcusable before God. It does not profit him. But the next thing, the first, so the first thing is good things that God gives are grace. And that's the first error. And I often, when I'll speak to people about that, I'll say, that's one view. If you hear that, if you hear that teaching in 
Now say to someone, you hear that teaching in, that, in your churches, are you familiar with that? The thinking that if God gives good things to someone, that's grace, that rain and sunshine is, is a gift of grace. Well, that's, so we say common grace type one. Second is the idea that this, these good things actually benefit the person and that God graciously restrains sin in an unbeliever's nature. And that was part of Bobbing's position. And I'll refer to that then as the second element of common grace, the a teaching that God graciously restrains sin in an unbeliever's nature. We're not talking now about the restraint of sinful deeds. We make that distinction. We do acknowledge that our scripture and our confessions speak of a restraint of sinful deeds, that man can't do all the sinful acts that he would want to do, that out of a desire not to have other people against him, out of a desire, of, out of a fear of punishment, and for various other reasons, he doesn't have the opportunity, he doesn't have the money, he doesn't have the health, or from civil government, there's various ways in which man is restrained in his sinful deeds that he doesn't commit all the sinful deeds that he would like to commit. But common grace is the, involves a teaching that God restrains sin in an unbeliever's nature, in his nature, so that there's still good in man. That's what I mean. You can have a man that's going to teach total depravity. And then he's going to say, God did not leave sin alone to do its destructive work. He had and after the fall continued to have a purpose for his creation. He interposed common grace between sin and the creation. A grace that, while it does not inwardly renew, nevertheless restrains and compels. All that is good and true has its origin in this grace, including the good we see in fallen man. That there's still good in fallen man. Isn't that a direct contradiction of total depravity? It is. But that's what was maintained. And along with that, the teaching that man still has the image of God. Those two go together. That God restrains sin in the nature of man, that he injects, as it were, common grace so that man did not completely lose the image of God. It says, consequently, traces of the image of God continue in mankind. And then he gives them a, a statement explaining that. Understanding and reason remain. And that's just part of that, that sentence, but I stop there because that serves to help bring out a very crucial point. For those that say that there is still good in the natural man, inevitably teach that man, there's still traces of the image in the natural man. And one of the things they very commonly say is he still has understanding or he still has a will. Over against that, it's very important that we understand that having an understanding and having a will belongs to man's nature. But a man can be either a righteous man or an unrighteous man. And a man can have an understanding that is endowed with a true knowledge of God, or his understanding can be darkened. And so the question is not, does he have understanding? The question is, does his understanding, is his understanding endowed with a true knowledge of God? If it is, then he bears God's image. If his understanding is not endowed with the true knowledge of God, if instead his understanding is darkened, then he does not. 
It's not just a question of whether or not somebody has understanding. Or with regard to the will. The question is not whether the man has a will. The question is whether his will is alive. And as our confessions bring out in the canons, the third and fourth head, Article 11, and in the rejection of heirs, number the second heir, that it brings out the idea that the man by nature, uh, his will is dead. It has lost the righteousness and holiness that belong to it. That if a man has a righteous and holy will, then he bears God's image. He bears the image of the righteous and holy God. But if he has lost the righteousness and holiness that belong to the will, then he has lost the image, though he remains a man. His will is, is dead. And that's the way our creeds speak to it, that when we're regenerated, our will goes from being dead to being alive. And now we're able to do good works, like a good tree producing good fruit. Grace, the idea that common grace, so the second teaching of common grace is the teaching that God graciously restrains sin in an unbeliever's nature. Now that uh, leads uh, also to the, uh, to the idea, to what would be a, th a third idea of common grace, and really we've already mentioned, is the common grace in the, in the preaching. Often distinguish, talking to people, the idea that good things, good things are gifts of God's grace. Secondly, that God restrains sin in the nature. And then thirdly, the idea that there is grace in the preaching for all who hear it. Those are three different ideas with regard to common grace. Some hold to all three, some only hold to like the first one and don't hold to others. With regard to that third one now, the idea that there's grace in the preaching. He did not, he did not say, or let me say it positively, he did say that God did not desire the salvation of all those who heard the preaching of the word of God. So when those who hold to the well-meant offer will say that they believe that God is desiring the salvation of all who hear the preaching, Bobbing said that he did not hold to that, although there are other statements that he makes that might make you wonder. But he does come out and say, and take a man at his word, he does say that he holds to this. But the difficulty of taking a man at his word is when he turns around and says something that's, that doesn't square with what he said someone else, somewhere else. That is the struggle of reading the man. But he did come out and make that point clear, that he did not say that God desired the salvation of each and every individual. However, he did say there is a grace in that preaching. And that is that the grace that comes to an unbeliever in the preaching of the gospel does restrain sin in him. It says that the call by law and gospel restrains sin, diminishes guilt, and stems the corruption and misery of humankind. Now, the, the, the wrong idea there is the idea that when God makes known truth to those who are unregenerate, that it has a positive effect on them. But that's easy for us to think, too that maybe if they keep hearing it over and over and over again, that maybe that they will improve. And it's important for us to confess, as we do, 
that the word of God has a twofold effect. The kingdom is opened to believers. It is shut against unbelievers. It is a means of grace to believers. It works faith, and the sacraments confirm that faith to believers. But there is a negative effect upon those who reject it, and that their, their, their guilt becomes worse because they are not listening to the word. And the more they hear the word and reject it, the more their guilt is worse, and the more they're given over then to sin, so that they will go deeper into sin. They're not going to benefit by it. He also spoke, and this was already mentioned, that he also spoke of a preparatory grace for those that are going to be born again, but are not yet. So that there are those who are not born again yet, and yet when the preaching comes to them, there is some preparatory grace that God is giving to them that prepares them for later. Yet he wrote in his Reformed Dogmatics, page 40, volume 4, for that reason we can properly speak of a preparatory grace. He, he earlier said that the Reformed rejected the idea of preparatory grace. And then he said, well, we can't mean it in the Arminian sense. And then he said, we can speak of it, even after he had recently said that the Reformed had rejected it. He said, well, there's a good sense we can speak of it. He says, God himself in many different ways prepares for his gracious work in human hearts. And these are examples. He aroused in Zacchaeus the desire to see Jesus. So Zacchaeus is viewed as being an unregenerate person when he was seeking Christ. And that was preparatory grace he had received. Produced distress in the crowd that listened to Peter. So those that were listening and experiencing a conviction of sin were, uh, and who then said, you know, men and brethren, what shall we do? And who desired to, to be saved, that they were receiving preparatory grace before rebirth. He gives us another example, the disconcerted jailer at Philippi, the Philippian jailer. And he says that God so directs the lives of all his children, even before and up to the hour of their rebirth, graciously working in their hearts before they are born again. Uh, the preaching of the law and gospel Distress about sin and fear of judgment, development of conscience and the felt need for salvation. All of this is grace preparing people for rebirth. So it's grace that comes to those that have not yet been born again. So there's that error also with regard to the teaching of grace. And over against that, it's important for us to confess the truth that to receive blessings, blessings flow to us through the bond of faith. And that to be in, we have to be engrafted into Christ solely by God's sovereign grace and to receive the life of Christ and with the life of Christ all the blessings that are found only in Christ. So those are some of the examples of three different uh, types, uh, three different positions with regard to common grace that he taught. The second area that I'd like to speak on rather briefly is the fact that he taught that common grace, and especially, specifically in the form of general revelation, 
is a link to unite the church and the world. And that was specifically what our fathers spoke against, that they warned that this doctrine would unite the church with the world, that you've made a connecting link between the church and the world with this doctrine of common grace, and that if it was allowed to remain, the church would join with the world, and be swallowed up by the world. And that's what's been seen. It isn't the case that if you take those that are holy, and if you join them with those that are unholy, it doesn't happen that the ones who are unholy become holy. And it's a point that you can bring out to little children, that if you take a child that is filthy, clothes covered with mud, and one, another child with new clothes on, and if the two of them are to hug and embrace, is the filthy one going to make the clean one, or rather is the clean one going to make the unclean one clean? Of course, anybody knows that no, what's going to happen is now they're both going to be filthy. And that was illustrated, as God brings out in the prophets in the Old Testament, that was illustrated by the Old Testament laws, that if somebody touches something unclean, they become unclean. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you. That is, God gives that call, come out, touch not the unclean thing. That if the church says, I will join with them, I have a point of contact, a place where I can touch the world, and I can help make it clean. That the scripture says, no, that's not what's going to happen. It's going to be the other way around. And that that is what has happened. But he's explicit about the idea of there being this link. My brothers have already made a reference to that. General Revelation, he writes, maintains the unity of nature and grace, a phrase he commonly refers to, of the world and the kingdom of God. In fact, that helps to understand the meaning of that phrase, nature and grace. That can be a hard phrase to get a hold of. It's one of those phrases that they can use frequently, and you wonder, now what exactly do you mean when you say nature and grace, nature and grace? Here he puts right next to it a further explanation. General Revelation maintains the unity of nature and grace of the world and the kingdom of God. And he speaks, he speaks of elsewhere on that. And he says that the next, the next idea that goes along with that is if there's a connection, what's the connection for? And the answer there is that the church is called to serve the world. The church serves the world. Israel and the church are elect for the benefit of humankind. That's the language he uses in Reform Dogmatics, Volume 1, page 320. He says the church is elect for benefit of all humankind. Now, we could speak of the fact that all humankind is blessed in Abraham. All nations are blessed in Abraham, but that means they're blessed in the church. In the church. That that's the idea that all nations are saved. But he uses language. And I'll grant that there are places where you read him that you're wondering, no, what exactly does that mean? 
but that is, it's in harmony with what he was teaching, that the idea is that all the emphasis, and so much is that the case around us today, that God's people are being told that they're supposed to be out there serving the world, making the world a better place. And they can, they can point to passages like this. However Bob Inc. would explain them, they, he's left open to that. He says in uh, his speech on common grace in the Theological Journal, he wrote, the Calvin Theological Journal, but if the kingdom is not of, it is certainly in this world, and then he goes a step further. I mean, I mean people often say that. We're not of the world, but we're, we're here in this world. But he says... It's not of the world, it's certainly in this world and is intended for it. The kingdom is intended for the world. But there's great danger in that. There's another, another danger that I would like to take uh, have more, be able to know in more detail what he means, but I have noted the fact that he makes a reference to a distinction between God the Father and our creation and God the Son and our redemption, which, I mean, that's straight from our confessions, that distinction, but that that distinction of God the Father and our creation God the Son in our redemption, when that distinction is made, and that comes up when we say, how is the Heidelberg, how is the Apostles' Creed divided? So I give you one example of a reference to that. And in the Heidelberg Catechism, it says it's divided into three parts of God the Father in our creation, God the Son in our redemption, and God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. That's a sound biblical doctrine. But that distinction can be taken to try to promote the idea that one can be led to think that this, the idea is that there's a certain goal that God, the Son, is accomplishing in the church. And then there's a goal that God, the Father, is pursuing with the creation and that he makes statements that would lead one to think that way that he says for example in in page this is page 56 in the in the theological journal article that he will say uh, He says, all these and many other questions are determined by the problem of the relation between creation and recreation. He's trying at various places, you do sense that he is trying to figure out how to resolve this. What he's teaching. On the one hand, the form faith. On the other hand, as what he's trying to build this earthly kingdom idea by common grace. How can you promote the building of an earthly kingdom by common grace and the heavenly kingdom by special grace? How can you do both? That on the one hand, he says, there's no wonder that such a delicate and complicated problem remains unresolved. Unresolved. And yet he says in that same context that these and many other questions are determined by the problem. The problem here, he says, is the relation between creation and recreation, salvation. And then he says between the work of the Father and the work of the Son. So that he's suggesting that maybe the answer can be there. Distinction between the work of the Father 
and the work of the Son. But such a statement can lead one to wonder, well, what's that going to mean then for the doctrine of the Trinity? If you've got one being the work of the Father over here, he's got a certain goal, then you've got the work of the Son over here, and he's got a certain goal. What is that going to mean then for the doctrine of the Trinity? And I'd have to do more reading in that, in his writings, to know more specifically how he would try to answer that. But that's, that's an important question to be considered as to where it would lead. Problems, principles, when people try to hold to wrong principles, they get into deeper and deeper doctrines as time goes on. Over against that, it's important for us to recognize and for us to stress the idea to our, to our children that we are involved not only on the Lord's Day, but throughout all of the week, as my colleague was, one of my colleagues was alluding to, the idea that it's not just in the work of the church, formal work of the church institute on Sunday, but throughout all of the week that we are busily engaged in kingdom work. That we are constantly, as we are, believing the word, searching the scriptures, seeking to live out the truth that we confess, applying it in all aspects of life in the home, in our, in our workplace, in the school, as we bear witness to others by our words and our actions, that we are always doing kingdom work. But that there are, the, kingdom we are, the kingdom work we are doing has to do with the kingdom of God, the, the kingdom that God is building the city whose builder and maker is God. And that even though we may work right alongside with the people of the world, that we and they may be both working on trying to come up with a new medicine, for example, that even though we may be doing many of the same activities that they're doing, and we may, from a certain, just looking at it externally, we could say we have the same goal, we're both trying to come up with a new medicine. We're doing it really with very different goals in mind. That we are not, from a deep spiritual point of view, our concern is always the glory of God and the good of his people. And that's not the view of the world. That's not the goal of the world. That rather this world is building a city with no foundation where the only city that will stand is the city whose builder and maker is God. And over against the teaching of common grace, it's very important that we and our children understand the house of the, how God builds his house. What it means that grace is particular, that it is a power, an irresistible power by which we become more like our God. For us to teach our children that the good things they have are not themselves, why do we ask God food if it's a blessing itself? Instead we say, as we do in the Heidelberg Catechism, that these things can't profit us without the word of God's blessing. We need the word of God's blessing. And to bring that out to our children, it's the blessing of God that we need. That one can have great abundance. But if you don't have the blessing of God, those things don't profit you. And one can be experiencing great affliction. And with the blessing of God, you are profiting by that affliction. How important it is for us to hear that. For us to hear the idea that there's no good in this world and there's no good in us by nature, and those go together, that we have to spiritually stay separate from this world and spiritually throw off our old man and recognize there's no good in it. It has to be
thrown off. And rather we have to put on the new man. It's the new man that bears the image of God. We are new creatures, God the Father and our creation. Speaking of that, makes us think about the fact that we are new creatures in Jesus Christ. The baptism form brings out God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three, from the viewpoint of how all three are involved in our work of salvation, that we're baptized in the name of the triune God, and that by His grace we are part of that heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. I thank you for your attention.